Good afternoon and welcome to this seminar, this joint seminar of the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology and the Asia Pacific Cardiometabolic Consortium. I'm Phil Elwood, I'm speaking to you from Adelaide in Australia. We've got two presentations, uh, one by Dr. Yu Kateoka from the National Cerebral and Cardiovascular Center in Japan, and one by Dr. Jasmine Dalal from the Colobayan Hospital in India. After each presentation, we'll have discussions by Professor Steve Nichols from Monash in Australia and Dr. K.K. Yeo from the National Heart Center in Singapore. We'll run for about half an hour for each uh, presentation, so we'll get through the whole thing in an hour. Uh, I'd like at this point, therefore, to uh, welcome Dr. Kathy Oka to talk to us about uh, these key updates from the ESC 2021, high-resolution assessment of coronary plaques in a global Egolokoma randomized study, the Hoyland study. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Phil and APSC members, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Yu Kataoka from National Cerebral Cardiovascular Center, Osaka, Japan. Uh, I'd like to present a primary result of the Hoijen study, which was conducted by Steve Nichols, and I was involved in this study as a steering committee member. This is my disclosure slide. So, uh, so let me start the uh, uh, features of uh, HCS in terms of the, its plaque characteristics. As we know, the HCS occurs due to the repeat reach plaque, and Basically, the character region has uh, much, much lipids with a thin fibrous cap. And then we know that uh, vulnerable plaque exists not only at culprit site, but uh, at the non culprit site. This is a coronary angioscopic data from Japan, and it showed that uh, lipid plaque at LAD, which is culprit site, but we saw the yellow lipid rich plaque in the left circumflex artery and right coronary artery. So the basically the vulnerable plaque should exist uh, entire coronary artery, which causes additional uh, uh, coronary events in the future. So, and uh, the one of the uh, high risk features of the ACS is the uh, uh, clinical outcomes following ACS. Uh, this is a prospect study data and it showed that uh, half of the coronary events uh, is driven by the non culprit related events. And also the another important finding in this study is that uh, an elevated risk of the subsequent events was within the one year, mainly. So I think this uh, very acute phase after ACS or subacute phase is quite vulnerable associated with uh, additional coronary events. So I think it's important to manage this kind of uh, high risk phase. So there are a lot of evidence to modulate a uh, plaque, a uh, high risk plaque by starting with LDLC lowering. In the left panel, uh, Steve and I did a uh, IBAS analysis before, and it showed that a uh, vulnerable plaque progression rate was quite high. But if we use the starting with lower LDL cholesterol level, it showed quite regression. In the uh, light panel, uh, we conducted an uh, observational study with OCT imaging. And if we control LDC below 70, fibrous skip sickness uh, looks better. So I think the statin is one of the good uh, agents to modulate plaque features. And then the, uh, the Steve Nichols uh, demonstrated the uh, Graukov studies evidence which conducted by IBAS study, and it showed that uh, marked regression on Evalocumab uh, with uh, very, achieving very low LDLC around 20 or 30 milligram per deciliter. So the question is the, how much LDLC cholesterol lowering with Evalocumab could modify uh, vulnerable plaque in ACS. So the Hoijen study is a, a prospective randomized multicenter global study, which enrolled 161 non stemi patients. And the inclusion criteria was shown here, which is elderly cholesterol criteria, and they received maximally tolerated studying. And then patients should have OCT match with uh, fibrous cap sickness below 120 micron 
and the another image should have repeat arc above 90 degree. And patients were randomized placebo, placebo injection or evolocumab injection for one year. And then we did uh, OCT and IBAS again at one year after the therapy. And we, uh, the core lab did uh, imaging analysis of OCT and IBAS. And this slide showed the I OCT analysis in the Hoygen study. We conducted a 0.2 millimeter image analysis in each case. And then primary endpoint was change in fibrous cap thickness. And secondary endpoint was percent change in minimum fibrous cap thickness and these uh, outcomes. And in this study uh, from 161 cases, uh, then we randomized it and Finally, the 70 placebo and 65 evalocumab patients completed the uh, follow-up imaging. And then uh, a final uh, data set was uh, 135 cases with paired, IBUS, paired OCT data. Uh, let me show the baseline clinical data in this study. Uh, basically, the patient's uh, age was around 60, and most are male. And prior starting use about four weeks was almost uh, 25%. And most of the cases received a high intensity starting around 80%. And this is the uh, LDL cholesterol data in this study. Uh, predictably, uh, Evalocumab uh, substantially lowered LDL cholesterol level by, uh, to 28 milligram per deciliter where the in the placebo group, on treatment, treatment LDLC at one year was 87 milligram per deciliter. And this is the baseline OCT measures. I think the one of the uh, interesting finding is the minimum fibrous cap thickness in both groups. It was a 54 micron, which means that uh, we analyzed a uh, very high risk uh, vulnerable uh, plaque in this study. And the target uh, segment has a quite large repeat arc and fibrous cap thickness below 65 micron. Its frequency was over 70 and repeat rich plaque was over 90%. So we could get a lot of uh, vulnerable region uh, in this Huygen study. Huygen study. Uh, this is the primary result of the Huygen study. Uh, uh, during the uh, one year therapy, uh, minimum fibrous cap thickness, its absolute change was uh, plus 21 in placebo and plus 42 uh, micron in the Ebarokimab group, and it was statistically significant. Uh, this is the secondary endpoint, which is the percent change in minimum fibrous cap thickness. And uh, similarly, Ebarokimab was associated with uh, a uh, much increase in fibrous cap thickness uh, for uh, after the one year therapy. And then we looked at the uh, frequency of uh, patients with uh, minimum fibrous cap thickness below 65 micron. And at one year, only 12% of patients had uh, minimum FCT below 65 mic uh, micron in the Ebarokimab group where the 30% of the cases had still vulnerable region under the placebo therapy. And then the, the another secondary endpoint was the maximal repeat arc. And it clearly showed that Ebalocumab uh, induced a uh, marked uh, shrinkage of the lipidic plaque component uh, compared to the placebo, which was uh, minus 57 degree uh, decrease in the repeat arc. And then uh, I show the uh, lowest plot in terms of uh, achieved LDLC cholesterol level and fibrous cap thickness is absolute change. And it showed that uh, if we achieve very, very low LDLC level, uh, fibrous cap, uh, we could get a much increase in the fibrous cap thickness. Uh, similarly, uh, in the light panel, it brought uh, bit the association between changing LDLC and absolute change in minimum fibrous cap thickness. Interestingly, we, if we got uh, over 60 
milligram per decile LDL cholesterol reduction, uh, the, we could get a much larger increase in the fibrous cap six, about fibrous cap. Uh, this is a, a safety data and clinical events. And it didn't show any uh, issue in terms of the safety uh, event, safety issues. And this is the kind of summary of the slide. So in this Hoygen study, we show that uh, high risk plaque could be stabilized by evalocumab therapy. Uh, in this study, the baseline lipid plaque arc was 230, and then it went to the 173 degree. In terms of the fibrous cap, uh, the at baseline was 556, and then it goes to almost 100. So it seemed to be that uh, epilocumab was quite effective to uh, modulate uh, vulnerable regions. Uh, let me think uh, uh, a, couple, a couple of insights from the, these findings. I think the, this, this kind of study showed that uh, SINA capped plaque uh, respond very well to the repeat learning therapy. Uh, I showed uh, one of the data from Japan, and this is a serial OCT study in 40 AMI patients, and they did a uh, baseline of nine months OCT imaging. And they reported that if uh, Prague had thin cap, the, the degree of sick, uh, sickening of the fibrous cap quite uh, high, where the if we use a we, mod, uh, we treated a uh, sick cap, it, the, its response was quite small. So I think the, it is important to tr uh, target very thin cap, uh, high risk or vulnerable plaque for the uh, potent lipid loading therapy. So as I said, the, the, in the Huygens data, the target plaque fibrous cap sickness was around 50. So it should be the uh, important target for us to treat it. And in another thought, uh, this is the Fourier uh, data from New England Journal in 2017. And this is the key secondary endpoint, which is the CVDS non fatal mild stroke. You know that uh, uh, Ebrokim was effective, and the event curve was separated from around one year. And hazard ratio of the non fatal MI was 0.73. And then uh, the another sub-analysis was published in 2020. Uh, it analyzed uh, efficacy of ebrocumab in recent MI and remote MI cases. And then they show that in the recent MI cases, ebrocumab therapy was uh, quite effective in terms of the reduction of the key secondary endpoint, especially within the one year. So I, I think if a patient have quite vulnerable, like a ACS or a recent MI, they should have a very high region with thin cap. And then if we treat with evalocumab, we could get a much benefit. So I think the Huygens study showed that importance to commence a very potent agent in the specific high risk patients such as ACS. Uh, this is the conclusion slide of Huygens study. Uh, in patients with non STEMI, we show that evalocumab therapy with uh, high intensity therapy resulted in greater increase in the fibrous cap sickness and decrease in the repeat arc. And at 30 months after a non STEMI, only 12% of patients with evalocumab had a uh, minimum fibrous sickness below 65. Uh, and the degree of benefit of repeat learning therapy was directly proportional to the current agents. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, a great presentation and very important study. I'm going to ask uh, KK to, to discuss and comment on this first, and then if there's any questions, hopefully you can put them through the chat line. KK. Uh, thanks, uh, Jimmy. Uh, that's a very nice overview of the study. Um, you know, Arising from the Glagov uh, study, I think the question that has always been on our mind is uh, how aggressively we should pursue lipid lowering with uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors uh, at the time of uh, a patient's uh, most uh, acute illness, and in this case, in the setting of an acute coronary syndrome. Um, this uh, particular study, which uh, uh, Steve uh, led, uh, is, is quite telling in the findings. 
So perhaps I could I could uh, ask uh, Jimmy and uh, you know uh, what your thoughts are. Do you think that uh, in the setting of uh, these uh, uh, imaging studies that that there should be enough for us to change practice, uh, or do you think we need uh, a hard clinical evidence for this subset of patients? Uh, thank you very much for your question. And uh, from the Hoyan study, I think the we have to consider the to add a uh, PCS inhibitor in ACS even after using the high density study. And I think that it's important to use OCT imaging to identify the high risk plaque at the non calypsus site. So if we see any vulnerable region at non calypsus site, it's, it means that we have to consider the addition of the PCS inhibitor in the ACS, even if they achieve the good LDC cholesterol level. So, uh, in fact, that was my next question. Does it mean that, um, you know, would it, because this is a very, um, uh, this therapy is uh, expensive, does it mean that uh, in order to use uh, a PCSK9 inhibitor in addition to maximally tolerated statins, we should do some form of intravascular imaging uh, so that, you know, we meet, uh, we identify patients, um, you know, in terms of uh, lipid arc and fibrous cap thickness uh, to to treat them with uh, PCSK9 inhibitor. Um, do you think that is something we should be doing routinely, or do we need more data before it can enter uh, routine clinical practice? Mm. Well, um, I think the one of the issue is, is that the OCT imaging is very invasive approach, and most J Japan is okay to use OCT imaging, but uh, some countries not due to the insurance issues. So it may be good to find any other non-invasive approach like a biomarkers or a CT or, or MRI stuff to find the high-risk drugs or high-risk patients. That's and, I and, that's yeah, Christian. and I, I, mean, I mean, I think it's a really important question. And I, I mean, I don't think we do these studies at, to advocate that we should be doing intravascular imaging in people. I think that they tell us an important message about the biology that we think underlies the ongoing risk in these patients. And, and as Jimmy pointed out, the, um, you know, the sub-analyses of Fourier are really important in that they identify a series of patients where we think the, there is a much greater benefit from uh, intervening, you know, whether that's multivessel disease, recurrent events, those types of things. And I, I, I agree that the likelihood that a combination of clinical factors and biomarkers that may reflect a more vulnerable form of disease is probably where we should start today. Whether we ultimately use imaging and perhaps non-invasive imaging uh, may not be a bad way to think about it. Um, in the future uh, to help risk stratify and identify patients who may benefit from really aggressive therapy. But, you know, for us, what I think the real take-home message is that certainly getting people home on maximally tolerated statin therapy and probably a greater number of patients in combination with azetamide is going to be a really good first step to go. Um, and if we can maximize adherence to that, um, then we think that intensive lipid lowering produces benefits. And, and we saw benefits in the other group here. And I think that's an important point to keep in mind that, that the comparator here were patients treated really well with conventional therapy. And if they stuck to that, their fibrous cap thickened, their lipid arc reduced, it just didn't do it as well as the group that were able to achieve a much lower LDL. Yeah, in fact, I was going to ask you in terms of um, some of these other non-invasive markers um, in, in the Huygens study, did you all uh, explore um, any of the biomarkers in, in the cohorts or is it something that you have you know, um, planned for uh, later uh, analysis? Uh, what would we do as, as a later analysis? Uh, for biomarkers, exploratory yeah. analysis. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think there's an important analysis to be done here, which is actually pulling the treatment groups together and saying, well, look, in general, these patients were treated uh, 
pretty well from a lipid lowering perspective and, and it enables us now to look at what are the factors that identify individuals who do better or worse above and beyond simply LDL lowering, which we've, which we've clearly established here is really important. Jimmy or Steve, maybe I'd ask you whether, from, not from this study, but from previous studies, do you some have some idea of the speed of this process? Is, and does that depend on how low you get the LDL? Do you see these changes a, a month, three months? I mean, the study was a year, I know, but uh, do you have any feel for that? Yeah, so, th so there's a really interesting parallel uh, report in the Journal of Cardiology late last year by Dr. Yano and colleagues from Japan. And what they reported were observations from a non-randomized retrospective analysis in their, in their center. And they compared 18 individuals who were treated with evolocumab in addition to a statin. And they compared them to 40 individuals who'd just been treated with a statin alone. And they showed a similar incremental benefit uh, albeit non-randomized of adding evolocumab to a statin. But what was really important in that study was that the follow-up imaging was at, was at four and 12 weeks. And so as early as four weeks, you start to see the benefits of intensive lipid lowering, uh, thicken the cap and reduce the arc with a greater benefit in the combination group. And then that continues to get uh, more clear at 12 weeks. And so I think if you combine these findings together, they suggest to us that, um, that those benefits can occur early and, and probably reinforce the idea of trying to get maximum intensive lipid lowering on board as early as possible. And that is a bit different than the way many patients are treated in the real world where we start them on a statin, we send them home, Sometime down the track, we do another lipid profile. We may add another therapy. Sometime down the track, we add something else. And, and so that, you know, what we're learning here is that hitting them hard early seems to have an early benefit. Yeah, that's good. So maybe we could ask Steve that the, I think the point it was 0.7 in our language or 28 uh, was the goal of, with Eva Lockermap. Should that be the new target? Uh, I mean, the Australian target officially is still 1.8 uh, or 70. Yeah, it, it is. And, and, and so um, I think every time we do these trials that we think that they, they certainly encourage us to take more and more patients, probably lower LDL cholesterol levels. I think we have three outcome trials that probably support taking high-risk patients to an LDL closer to 1.3 or lower. This certainly suggests the biology is more favourable the lower you go. Um, and certainly, you know, I would like to think that in my practice, I'm probably more likely to treat more and more patients to a lower target, uh, particularly anybody who I think has got any sort of significant ongoing risk of events. So, Jimmy, what's the target in Japan? What's the official target? And, and, and 70 now in ACS. Yeah, mm, but uh, some doctors want to uh, down to the fifty-five, but uh, still, <laughs> I think the I think the event rate in Japan it, Japanese is a bit low compared to the foreign foreign countries. So some people are still debating that uh, LDLC like hundred is okay for ACS, and some doctors are fifty-five. So lots of argument is still ongoing. KK Singapore. Pretty much the same. Uh, we are moving aggressively towards lower targets, and I think um, the the ES uh, ESC guidelines uh, do help push that needle a lot. Um, we start. We we still also struggle with some of the uh, you know fake news regarding uh, statins. I, I wonder whether the PCSK9 inhibitors will have that same problem, um, and also I wonder whether in countries uh, such as in Japan whether there are concerns regarding LDL um, levels uh, and, and the dose of statins. Is there, is there such a concern with PCSK9 inhibitors um, for, uh, for Japan um, in terms of the dosing? 
you mean the consent for the PCS inhibitor use? Uh, yeah, is there any consent at all? Ah, uh, no, we don't take that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But Jam, uh, Shad, I think you had a, wanted to say something. Yeah, I, a couple Welcome. of points. One is, uh, I was going to ask about the same thing as to how quickly the effect takes place. And you mentioned it takes uh, within four weeks. But still, the Fourier and the other trials actually took a year for the cardiac events to present. So, though some changes may be beneficial early, it takes a long time to benefit. The question also I wanted to ask is that we concentrate on ACS patient and high-risk patients. But we do a lot of CT angiograms and we see the 60% lesions in asymptomatic patients who not had an event. Uh, would these patients benefit from such dramatic actions? Because this uh, the angios you showed were not critical lesions. They were just vulnerable plaques which are non-significant. So if you pick up these plaques on a CT angio, would you still recommend getting the LDL down to 30s and 40s to prevent future problems? Or would you restrict this therapy only to those who have had an event? Well, uh, look, I think, I think it's a great question. I think that the first point I'd make is that in many countries... Uh, PCSK9 inhibitors are used either for patients who have uh, genetic dyslipidemia um, or patients who have clinically manifest disease uh, who have a still a too high LDL cholesterol level despite treatment. Um, when we do our imaging studies, interestingly, the type of patient you just described actually reflects the biology we often image. Uh, these intravascular imaging studies require to have some disease, but not too much disease because, you know, we get worried about doing intravascular imaging studies where there's a particularly tight stenosis. And so, you know, many of these patients have more moderate stenotic lesions. And so we ask ourselves the same question that you've just asked, which is, well, if the biology is responsive, would it be just as responsive if the person's not had an event? Um, I suspect it probably would, um, but uh, you know, it's hard to do these invasive imaging studies in people who don't have symptoms. And I think that's where the benefit of doing studies in the future with non-invasive techniques like CT enable for us to study a broader range of the clinical spectrum. And, and so those patients who've yet to have an event yet have biologically significant disease, whether it's burden or the composition on CT, um, I think are a really important group of patients uh, to, to study in the future because we know they're at a risk of having an event. Steve, uh, you and I are involved in a trial of raising HDL in those first three months after an ACS. Do you think if you did the study in them, you'd see the same changes or different changes? Well, look, I, I I think if it all works, Phil, I think it's going to show the same changes. And, and, you know, we've had the opportunity to study a range of therapies in the past and we've used intravascular ultrasound. Sometimes those therapies don't work. And, you know, we're always left wondering, have we used the right tool? Um, now, the challenge in the past was that we didn't have these other technologies that were sufficiently advanced enough to be able to do these studies. And I think now we do. Uh, and, and, you know, one of our take home messages for us has been, we think that this is an important tool that we'll be able to look at the effects of other therapies. We're doing a, a study in Australia at the moment, which is looking at the effects of culture scene, an agent that we know has a benefit on cardiovascular events and Peter Soltis in Adelaide. Is, is leading a clinical trial. And I think it gives us an opportunity to see how that might affect these plaque features on OCT. KK, any final comments? Um, no, I think uh, this is a, a very uh, important study because it gives a bit of uh, the mechanistic uh, basis for how a PACS-K9 uh, might, uh, you know, strategy in a post-ACS patient might work and aggressive lowering, whether it is with a statin or, or additional therapies like PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, may be important uh, you know, for the future. I think the, the biggest problem that we will have to deal with is cost. And uh, our payers will want cost-effectiveness study, you know, what, what is the what is the, what does it make sense, uh, willingness to pay threshold uh, for it to be instituted across, especially for especially when the government is the payer, I think we need to definitely address that uh, elephant in the room. Uh, 
Uh, but when if, if and when that uh, enters the guidelines and that willingness to pay threshold is met, then I think we, we will be able to use it in our routine care. If we intermittently lower the LDL to 30 in order to save costs, like for example, giving PCSK9 once a month or once in two months or three months or whatever, would that intermittent lowering of LDL improve the fibrous cap thickening and reduce the burden to some extent at least? Would that there be a sort of, can we do a viability with a longer duration of PCSK to save the cost and still see the benefit? I know it's a theoretical question, but uh, do you think that would be feasible? Well, I think it's a great question. And, and I think that it's a question that gets asked, um, particularly as we think of a range of new therapies that each are going to come with, a, with an associated cost. And, and the idea of, you know, do you take somebody for a finite period of time to a really low level of LDL, then bring them off the, the novel expensive therapy and leave them on background statin plus or minus azetamibe and an LDL of you know 1.5 to 1.8, which we know if you in the long term stay at that type of level, you don't tend to progress. Um, and there's something kind of appealing to that. Um, we've always thought that would make a nice clinical trial uh, to kind of do. Um, and, and maybe that will be a, a question we'll get to answer in the future. Yeah, I think that the big thing becomes thin again. Would the thick fibrous cap become thin again as the LDL went from 30 to 60 again? That would be interesting to see. Yeah. Or once the fibrous cap becomes thick, will it remain thick? Well, after we'll wait and see. I think it's time we moved on. Uh, Jasmine Jamshed, I'd like to welcome you. So it's Dr. Jamshed Dalal from the Kokolben Hospital in India. He's going to talk about hypertension guidelines, what to make of them. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the target blood pressure, which I think is an old topic. There's nothing dramatically new about it, but still uh, we seem to always ask this question, how low should the blood pressure be? And uh, what does the present uh, guideline suggest? Now, of course, we've got multiple hypertension uh, guidelines coming from various societies uh, with some very variation between what each society prescribes. So I'm just going to go through various, uh, various different guidelines to suggest what should be the optimal uh, ideal uh, target blood pressure for most of our patients. Now, why is it so important that we talk about this blood pressure guidelines and why is it so important to look at 120 systolic versus 130 versus 140? And you can see from this slide that if you look at the cardiovascular disease that's shown above and the mortality shown below, that every millimeter seems to matter. So clearly, as far as blood pressure targets are concerned, each millimeter up or down does make a difference to future cardiovascular events and mortality which is why it's so very important and why we have so many different guidelines suggesting mild variations. One would think, why would it be so important between 120 and 130 as the target? But obviously that has clinical relevance. So the question is how low should we go and is lower the better or is there some harm in, in doing that? Now there are a couple of points that we should understand. One is that the effectiveness of BP lowering treatment does not depend upon the starting BP level. So if you start at a BP of 150 and come to 120, you get the same benefit as somebody who's at 180 and comes to 120. So it's the eventual target level, which is more important than what level you actually began with. Additional BP reduction in a hypertensive patient's meeting initial BP targets produces further benefits. And we've seen that from uh, various studies showing that lowering BP from even 130 to 120, if the patient can tolerate it, produces further benefits. So that's again an important point to remember. And the data are supportive of utilization of BP lowering regimes, particularly in high risk patients, uh, both with and without hypertension. And I find this definition, a practical definition, uh, quite uh, nice. Uh, it says that the level of blood pressure at which investigations and treatment do more good than harm. So, I mean, that's where we, we want to have the lowest blood pressure, which will do good to the patient without doing any harm to the patient. Now, if you look at the categories of BP. One of the confusions that arose was in 2017, the American Heart Association changed the definition of blood pressure itself. So what was normal was below 120 by 80, but the blood pressure of 120 by one up to 129, which most of us can, can still considered as a high normal, uh, the ACS said that that was an elevated blood pressure. And they put stage one hypertension as 130 to 139. 
So that clearly raised a lot of fear about what is the correct value and do we now convert millions of people who were earlier considered as high normal into hypertension stage one. And this point has still been debated and the other societies do not agree uh, with this definition. If you look at the 2020 uh, International Society of Hypertension and even the ESC, they still maintain that high BP normal is 130, 139, and grade one hypertension should be above 140. So they still maintain, ESC still maintains, uh, along with the ISH and as the, even the Indian guidelines feel, that 130 to 140 should still be considered as a high normal blood pressure. Of course, we have to look at not just the clinic blood pressure, but also look at the blood pressure thresholds which we have on measuring the ABPM. So we clearly need to look not just at a single value, but we need to look at the blood pressure throughout the day. And also very important, look at the blood pressure at night as well. Now we know that practically it is not possible to do an ABPM on all our patients with hypertension. The British Hypertension Society suggests that we should have one reading before we actually start treating the patient. I think it's important practically to look at patients' night blood pressure, because I think treatment may differ from those who are dippers with and non-dippers. The treatment may differ in those who have a morning surge or not. And but it may differ again on patients who have uh, had a stroke at night or a myocardial infarction early morning. So I think we need to go beyond just the one single clinic measurement. Again, if you look at the <clears throat> BP goals, the American college, again, when they confused the initial uh, definition of blood pressure, they made actually the targets and the goals of BP very simple. So the BP threshold at which you need to treat the patient was 130 systolic except in patients who are at very low AC, ASCVD risk when you could go to 140, and those who had stroke where you could go to 140 as well. So uh, other than that, any patient whose blood pressure was more than 130, you need to bring the blood pressure down below 130. So it's actually looking at this, it's very simple. BP more than 130, treat it and bring it below 130. So clearly this was a very simplistic way of treating blood pressure. Uh, in terms of what the AC, uh, ACC suggested in 2017. The Canadian blood pressure targets were a little bit different. Uh, they showed in 2020 that they would divide them into low-risk and high-risk group. And therefore, in a low-risk group, they would try, start treating only at the blood pressure of 160 systolic with a target of below 140. However, if the patient was at a high cardiovascular risk, the threshold should be to start at 130 and to bring it down below 120. Diabetic patients above 130, bring it down to below 130, and all others 140 and bring it down to 140. So again, they were a bit lax in terms of when we should treat patients with low risk, and again, accepting 140 as a reasonably acceptable blood pressure. But in high risk patients and diabetic patients, they were more stringent, treat at 130 and bring it down to 120 or so. So clearly there was a little bit more uh, nuances to the blood pressure reduction. If you look at the European guidelines, and again, they divided into various age groups. So that was a difference. Again, if you are a patient from 18 to 65, your target threshold for treating the patient started when the blood pressure was more than 140. Remember, ACC said more than 130. <clears throat> European guidelines say more than 140 and a diastolic of more than 90. It was the same for those between 65 and 79, but above the age of 80, they said that, yes, you could treat the patient's threshold when the BP went above 160, the diastolic remaining at 90. So there was the only difference here was the leeway between those above 80 and those below 80, with not much difference between the 80 and up to 79. And the diastolic threshold was kept at more than 90 that requires to be treated. So clearly this was also a reasonably simple uh, uh, threshold of treating the patient. If you look at the target that we should achieve, then if you look at the 18 to 65, hypertension, diabetes, CKD, et cetera, whatever, target to 130. So their target was not as strict as bringing down to 120, but the target was to below 130, but not to below 120. So clearly the British and the Europeans suggest that too low blood pressure was not good, even for very young people. So that's one debatable point. And the diastolic pressure to be brought to 70 to 79. Again, in the 65 to 79, more or less same target, target to 130, 139, so little more leeway, and again, if tolerated. And clearly for the elderly, the target remains the same, but more towards 130 or 140. So clearly in the younger, you want to bring it down lesser, uh, more than you want to in the elderly. If you look at the hypertension patients and the diabetic, the target was 130, CKD patients 140, CAD 130 again. 
So clearly, CKD patients, there is a little anxiety that bringing the blood pressure down too low might create kidney problems. And we've seen that in sprint trial as well, that if too much lowering of blood pressure is done, the patient may get rise of creatinine, fall in creatinine clearance. So we need to be careful in the elderly patients and in patients with CKD as far as that achieving target is concerned. Uh, if just a quick look at the Indian guidelines, again, more or less the same as the European threshold target of around 140, except in coronary artery disease, where it's suggested as 130. But again, the target remains the same, reduced to below 130 by 80. The International Society of Hypertension then had a little a slightly different perspective, optimal and essential. Essential means reduce the blood pressure at least by more than 20 systolic and achieve at least 140. So this was an essential part of the treatment. That means every patient with blood pressure, whatever the comorbidities, this part was essential. And then optimal, they divided into age groups, less than 65 bring to 130 by 80, and more than 65, 140 by 90 was acceptable. And the aim, of course, was to get the blood pressure quickly controlled within the first three months. So little difference in terms of essential and optimal, and in the optimal between above and below 65 years. Now, all this is based on multiple trials. As you all know, SHEP was a very old trial, a five-year follow-up. Most of the patients were above 60 in the group. And you can see the diastolic blood pressure reduction from 76 to 67, and systolic from 170 to 140 produced dramatic benefits in terms of stroke, non-fatal MI, and various other parameters. So this was the reason right from the beginning why these targets have been there. Then, of course, SPRINT trial came which suggested that we should lower the blood pressure down to less than 120. We know the controversy about the methodology of measuring the blood pressure in the sense that the BP was measured by without any attendant being pressured, present by an automated machine with the patient resting, etc. And some suggested that what they considered as 120 by their methodology was actually around 130 when you did the usual blood pressure measurement uh, by medical staff. And clearly, even by reducing the blood pressure down to below 120, you can see a further significant benefit in terms of intensive treatment for the primary outcome as well as from death from any cause. So it clearly showed that reducing blood pressure more intensively to below 120 produced a 25% reduction in primary outcome, 27% death from any cause, and 43% death from cardiovascular causes. This, of course, raised a lot of... Uh, talk about how low we should actually reduce the systolic blood pressure. And I think till date, it remains debatable as to whether we should reduce the blood pressure down uh, to below 120 in all our patients. There were a group of patients who did get rise of creatinine, and there was a postural hypertension, particularly in the elderly. And I think therefore, those with renal disease and those who are very elderly, presumably above 75 or 80, one needs to be careful not to follow this too closely unless they're monitored. However, the SPRINT trial did conclude that even in the most elderly and the most frail patients, if they could achieve this blood pressure without having any side effects, either kidney or postural hypertension, they actually still did better. So I think we clearly need to individualize our patient. If you look at the ESC 2021, the STEP study group, they studied uh, patients, patients for 3.3 years, uh, average systolic blood pressure 20 millimeters in the intensive treatment and 10 millimeters came down in the standard treatment. So the BP in the intensive treatment was 124 against the standard, which was a mean of 135. The mean difference between the intensive and the non-intensive was about 10 millimeters of mercury. And the active control systolic blood pressure below 130 in the elderly and the elderly were 60 to 80 years. The hypertensive patients as compared to that below 130 resulted in lower incidence of major cardiovascular events with no increase in renal injuries. So again, the patient group was 60 to 80, so it was not above the 80 group. And again, lowering of blood pressure, 125 from 135 in the, between the intensive and the standard produced a further reduction in cardiovascular events. And they also suggested that home blood pressure monitoring may be more accurate than a clinic office blood pressure monitoring. So again, most studies do suggest that lowering the blood pressure down to below 130 is certainly of benefit. A quick word about diastolic, because people rarely talk about diastolic thresholds. And we know from past targets, the on target and transcend, that over a point, if you reduce the diastolic blood pressure too much, then you get organ perfusion problems and uh, again causes more problems, especially in those with fluidity, et cetera. And we all talk about the J-shaped curve. 
But at the same time, when you treat elderly patients, we know that diastolic blood pressure often falls down considerably. There was a lecture on diastolic blood pressure at the ESC. And again, they looked at various aspects of what's important in diastolic blood pressure. And if I can show you this slide. Now, we know in the past, we've always maintained that diastolic blood pressure is not important. But if you look at this particular slide, you can see that diastolic, this is the diastolic blood pressure. If you have a diastolic blood pressure 70 to 80 or 80 to 90, there's an optimal reduction of stroke and of, blood, of myocardial infarction. Of course, as your diastolic blood pressure goes up, both myocardial infarction and stroke go up. But if you look at the other side of the story, if you look at blood pressure going from 60 to 70 and going below 60, what happens is that the stroke remains good, which is fine because low diastolic blood pressure is good for stroke, but you can see myocardial infarction rising. So clearly myocardial infarction rise uh, with blood pressures below 60 is a cause for concern. So there was a preponderance of myocardial infarction uh, over strokes uh, at lower blood pressure. So I think we need to uh, keep that in mind when blood pressure diastolic goes quite down. Now, if we look at this particular graph, the red one is patients with revascularization and patients without revascularization. And that was seen in the FSS heart failure trial looking at the diastolic blood pressure. So clearly, one of the reasons why very low diastolic blood pressure produces a problem is that if patients have cardiovascular disease and they're non-treated, then they have a very high, strong J curve with increasing morbidity and mortality as diastolic blood pressure falls. But if you correct the coronary artery disease by revascularization, the J curve, J curve is not so marked. So clearly, we need to keep that point in mind when we treat blood pressure. Now, when I've discussed this point about diastolic blood pressure at various meetings, I've got various re responses from some saying, don't even look at the diastolic blood pressure to others saying diastolic blood pressure is important. Don't drop it below 60 at least. So 60 seems to be some sort of a cutoff point for a cause for anxiety, especially in those who have got coronary artery disease, which is uncorrected. Now, clearly, therefore, if you look at the guidelines in totality, the American College suggested that it should be treated when the blood pressure goes above 130, the European, uh, the uh, British, the Indian all suggest more than 140. But again, if you look at the final target, it's more or less the same. Bring it down to 130 by 80. So the hypertension definitions may be a little different, but the goal seems to remain the same. Points that need to be careful. If you're a diabetic, if you have heart failure, and if you have high CV risk, then you need to start early. If you've got CKD, if you're elderly, and if you had a past stroke, then maybe you don't need to be... Uh, start very early. Again, bringing down to 130 by 80 is recommended by everybody. Uh, Europeans suggest don't bring it down too much. So therefore, should you believe in sprint trial? Should you not believe in the recent uh, ESC trial? Should you bring it below 120? Clearly, if you have CKD, be careful. If you're elderly, be careful. So I think I would conclude by saying that you should start treating 130 by 80 if you have a high-risk patient. And if you have CKD, elderly, or stroke, then you can start at 140. Bring it down to 130. In patients who are young and who can tolerate, 120 is fine. Elderly or CKD patients, be careful of lowering too much. So my take-home message is that there is more agreement between guidelines than major differences. All guidelines strongly recommend lower BP targets for high-risk patients. Emphasis on BP measurement, the way to measure, diagnostic tests, lifestyle and behavioral changes, of course, uh, remain very important. New lower thresholds to diagnose and treat hypertension above 130 are relevant, especially in high-risk patients. However, in low-risk patients, 140 is still a logical threshold. And of course, aggressive BP lowers may be difficult to achieve in all looking at all the problems associated, especially the fact that in spite of all these guidelines, the majority of about 50% of patients actually even achieve 140 or even 150 at times. So clearly goals are good to have, uh, but at the same time, the implementation is very difficult. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thanks very much, Jamshed. Um, Steve, I think you're going to lead the discussion on these hypertension targets. Yeah, thanks, Jamshed. That was outstanding. I mean, I think if you, if you could, if you could perform one clinical trial in the hypertension space, kind of moving forward, trying to put all that together, you know, what 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 would you do? <laughs> um, my personal feeling is that uh, from all the data that we have. Uh, that clearly lower the blood pressure is better. So I am. I do believe that if you can have your blood pressure at 120 systolic, it's good for you in terms of various uh, benefits that in cardiovascular and stroke as well. The problem is that 
would you be able to get achieve this blood pressure level uh, with the medications how many medications would you need to achieve this and would you have, uh, have the compliance from the patient for maintaining this blood pressure also of course i would definitely be more uh, on the uh, lookout for postural hypertension which is very important i would look out for rise of creatinine clearance and we know that as patients get older the creatinine clearance uh, reduces so we need to keep that in mind so the medicine and the level that you may be okay with say 120 in an 80 year old person as he becomes 82 84 85 i might change and allow him to go to 130 because the creatinine clearance might have dropped by itself naturally or might drop further but clearly i feel that a good low blood pressure is definitely beneficial uh, as far as patients are concerned about the diastolic blood pressure i am still confused as to what should be the level uh, it's easy to say that do not allow the blood pressure to go below 60 or 70 diastolic but that's not possible often if you see an elderly person he comes to you with a diastolic of 50 systolic is 180 i mean do we treat do you not treat what do you do so that part still confuses me i just go ahead and treat the systolic to be honest yeah okay okay your thoughts you know this is a very nice uh, summary and overview by jamshed um i kind of like the summary slides in which you know essentially as you say that the 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 views from across the atlantic are you know divergent yet convergent and it makes it easier for practice the problem i have in practice has to do with the fact that many of my patients come in um anxious and annoyed after waiting a long time can't find parking you know traffic jams and what not and you know their pressures are inevitably high and they always tell me well it was fine this morning you know it was just 120 when i woke up and i'm like yeah i think your blood pressure is probably more accurate um so i almost wonder whether that trial that you 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 ask for um you know steve would be one in which we adjust a blood pressure according to home blood pressure levels uh the problem of course is uh you know whether or not that that is reliable so we would have we would have challenges in 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 that sense but in my mind that may be a more pragmatic uh, approach in which we look at a patient's home blood pressure and and i face that same problem as well patients swear that you know their blood pressure monitor at home is 15 to 20 mm of mercury better and 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 you know whenever i then say well why don't we resolve it by doing a 24 hour uh monitor um they were inevitably right um and 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 you know i guess to us the two of you um and and jam said you you kind of touched on um the use of ambulatory monitoring and and the british suggestion that we should do it on everybody before we start therapy and whether that's realistic i guess the question to the two of you is is so who should we be doing um uh 24 hour blood pressure monitoring on i think uh, blood pressure monitoring home is difficult patients don't like it don't want to repeat it and actually it's not a true blood pressure at night because they wake up wearing at night i think if you had a watch blood pressure which measures at night <clears throat> that would be better and i've tried out the watch bp machine it works very well at night it doesn't work well during the daytime when you're moving around but it gives you very good blood pressure recordings at night without much disturbance the other thing i learned from covid was that uh more more and more people are now measuring blood pressure at home because they could not come to the hospital more of them have bought bp machines uh what i did also realize that they don't know how to measure the blood pressure because just out of uh, trying to get a sort of uh, personalized feeling during the online i used to ask them to do the bp monitoring and do it in front of me while i was online and god they did horrible job with bp monitoring with all sorts of uh, rubbish, you know so clearly the people people don't know how to do home monitoring i also feel that we should give them a bp machine which does the actual three readings and gives a mean of the three over a five minute period i think that gives a much better reading i usually found them just quickly wrapping quickly within a minute then they said oh bp is so and so and and the tubes were up and the things it was complete mess on top of clothes etc so i think one is of course bp monitoring at home is much better than the home office bp monitoring i think it's more practical than an abpm but i think a proper bp machine and a education of how to do it will probably go a long way thank you i mean the other i mean the other setting that that i find a patient who have a trans thoracic echo for some reason and it comes back and you know their lv functions all right but they've got you know mild lv wall thickening um they've got perhaps mild ascending aortic dilatation for all intensive purposes they've got an echo 
that looks like somebody who's probably had long-standing hypertension and and you know then you might find a blood pressure monitor um, then shows you know a lack of nocturnal dipping or features like that and you know sometimes these patients end up find, are found to have hypertensive responses to exercise um, whether it's on a monitor whether it's on a treadmill or those types of things and so um, you know there are a, a range of different settings in which um, trying to get more information about blood pressure and and you know this idea of how do we move that from kind of the 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 kind of laborious 24-hour monitoring that we've done to using wearables and those other things um, may, may be really important in the future. Yeah, and in fact, I do believe that there are several companies that make um, wearables uh, for blood pressure that is that is FDA approved. Some of them are a bit more uncomfortable than others, but there are some brands that appear to be pretty, you know, pretty comfortable. I think that will be key. They do have to, some of them do it on the fly and others uh, only when you activate the device. But regardless, um, I think there's that, you know, hopefully in the next uh, few years, we would have devices that allow us to, to track a patient's blood pressure at home in a fairly comfortable manner. The, the, the standard ambulatory blood pressure is not comfortable and, you know, I suspect it can cause people to have elevated blood pressures at night, you know, yeah. That, yeah. that is something that uh, that does affect our management strategies. And and as we're kind of getting towards the end of this session, I, I can't help but think that I need to ask the, the parallel of the kind of the questions that we talked about in the first half of this session, where I think on the lipid side, we're starting to realise that we, we're going to need to treat more and more people with combination lipid-lowering therapy. And, and, and I kind of see that as following the lead of the hypertension space where many patients end up on combinations and and there is a sense that maybe we should be starting combination therapy in in a number of patients early and i guess the thoughts from the two of you with regards to what we should be doing today from that perspective I usually start combination therapy for both lipids and hypertension. One drug usually never works. Fortunately, in India, we have combinations of statin and azetamide. So I invariably put them on this combination straight away uh, because very few people take azetamide if it's given as a separate pill because it somehow never reaches that stage with the physicians. So giving a combination right at the beginning, I think that's, that's really the correct thing to do. And then, of course, the PCSK9 would come later. So similarly, with blood pressure, starting with one tablet and then gradually increasing it, uh, the patients never seem to like to increase the dose of their medicines when they come for a next visit. They come with all sorts of excuse that the BP is very good at home, etc. So it's good to put a proper good combination therapy right in the beginning. And then if you find the BP is going too low, you could always withdraw. That will make the patient quite happy. So I usually combine tablets, maybe two or even three in, in a single pill. And again, as I said, in India, we have this advantage of multiple combinations and multiple doses of almost everything possible. So it's very easy for us to combine a little bit of beta blocker, a little bit of uh, and, uh, calcium blocker, etc. Again, at this point, I would like to mention one of the trials presented at ESC, which was the one-fourth dose of four tablets as a single combination. That has been presented earlier also, but it was presented also at ESC. And the great advantages were that every drug was just one-fourth the dose. So clearly, there was no side effects. Just one fourth of amlodipine will not produce edema. So they use, I think, ibercetan, uh, amlodipine, a diuretic. Uh, and clearly the benefit of this one fourth dose of each drug, four of them, produces a much better reduction of blood pressure, much less side effects and a much quicker reduction. So I think future is in this sort of a combination of tablets. Thank you. Yeah, I, I kind of like combination uh, as well. The only problem is whether to give it individually or, or as a combination pill. The problem with combination pills is that they're often proprietary and therefore, you know, very expensive uh, for our public payers. So I, I do think that there's that uh, other consideration as well. But from a, you know, um, benefit point of view, I, you know, it, it also depends on the patient's risk profile. Those with recurrent events that tend to start earlier. Absolutely. Okay, Phil, back over to you, I think. Yeah, well, Jamshan, I just have one very quick question for you about um, your lifestyle. We always say we do the lifestyle. Do you ever do that? Do they actually work? And what did you think of the salt study from China that showed even producing salt 25% had quite a dramatic effect? 
Is that something you'll incorporate into your practice? Yes, uh, the, the problem. Of course, we know that the couple of trials about salt production. Uh, again, you have to. The thing was they actually took the salt and replaced it with the potassium. So it's a government-based thing. So as well as here, we are individually telling the patient to take out the salt and buy potassium salt, etc. So that was one issue. Secondly, many of our patients are on diuretics. And often they tend to have low sodium, uh, uh, especially in the elderly. So I'm a little bit wary of giving too little assault to these patients because they invariably land up with hyponatremia. So I usually, once I start a diuretic, I tell them don't take extra salt, but take normal salt. As far as the other lifestyle is concerned, unless the patient is really obese and he can lose about 20 kilos, I don't think it affects the blood pressure. So if you're 85 and you come to 83 kilos, it's not going to really affect your blood pressure. So I think unless you've got gross uh, lifestyle problems, and you can correct those lost gross lifestyle problems, which are not easy to do so. I think you are going to need tablets to get the blood pressure to target. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to all our speakers uh, and uh, our discussants for this seminar. I hope uh, the audience have found it useful. We thank the Asia Pacific uh, Society of Cardiology and the Asian Pacific Cardiometabolic Symposium, uh, Symposium for putting this on. Um, I hope you'll attend our next uh, seminar sometime in the future. So thank you to all our speakers. And thank you to the audience. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.